Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Virtual Encounters. My name is Abhishek Mahajan. We have a very, very renowned guest today, five-time ICC umpire of the year, one of the best umpires cricket has ever seen and the one who can forget he officiated in 2011 World Cup Finals which India won at the Vankhede. Mr. Simon Toffel is with us today from Australia. Welcome sir, welcome to DD India. First of all, how have you been doing and uh, I need to ask you this, did you watch India versus Pakistan match and Pakistan buried the ghost and India, what do you think went wrong for them? Uh, Abhishek, look, thank you for that kind introduction. And look, quite frankly, I think India have had a pretty good run in World Cup campaigns against Pakistan. So perhaps they were due for a loss. But I think there were some wonderful takeaways, not only just the fact that a great atmosphere and a great contest, but probably some of those scenes after the match of mutual respect and some great sportsmanship being shown between the two teams uh, was probably my highlight to take away from that picture. Mm, right. Uh, you officiated in 2011 India versus Pakistan mm. match, which was held in Mohali, uh, the semi-final match, I remember. Uh, yes. <laughs> tell us, you took it as just another match or no? Umpires are also under pressure when they are uh, officiating in high-pressure game. Yeah, look, I think we had probably two finals in that 2011 Cricket World Cup. We had the semi-final in Bahali, India-Pakistan. What a great contest that was again. Uh, lots of media focus and lots of passionate fans looking to support their team. Uh, my approach on that day, just like the final was, to try and keep the focus really simple, try to concentrate on my game, try not to let too much of the external pressure affect me um, and to really just uh, bunker down with my teammates, the third team, the umpiring and refereeing team, and make sure that the fans and the spectators and the fanatics were going to remember the quality of cricket rather than the uh, the umpiring on the day. Mm, right. You also want to share uh, the experience of uh, officiating in the finals, India versus Sri Lanka at the Vankhede? You know, for me, it was just wonderful and a great honour and privilege to be part of a final. I, I think um, having Australia lose early on in the competition gave me an opportunity to be selected for the final, which hadn't existed in my previous two World Cup final campaigns. Um, Australia had been quite a successful team and due to neutrality regulations, uh, that sort of counted me out. But uh, super excited and very privileged to be uh, an Australian in the Cricket World Cup final. Yeah, but best match uh, you have officiated in? Uh, oh, Olympia. look, uh, very, very tough to, to single out one particular match. But you tend to remember your first, yeah. like your first test match, which for me was Boxing Day Melbourne, yeah. uh, Australia and the West Indies. Um, and also remember my last test match with great fondness. It was um, England and South Africa vying for number one in the world. And, um, you know, look to umpire on grounds like Eden Gardens, Wanketi, Wanketi, um, but also Cape Town, you know, and to see the, the wonderful backdrop of Table Mountain. The SCG that we've got in the background there was lucky enough to do Australia versus the rest of the world in 2005. Um, and so privileged to be part of, um, you know, some wonderful legends of our game uh, that we'll, mm. we'll cherish for a long time. Mm. First matches are always special. Simon, you were only 27 when you made your debut as an umpire in international cricket at very, very young age. But I want to ask you, when did you think of becoming an international umpire? What dragged you here? Were you always passionate about this role? I'm oh, passionate about cricket. I love the sport, but I started late as a player. I, yeah. I didn't start playing until about the age of 12. Hmm. But I suppose my umpiring career, if I could call it that at that stage, was actually with Barry Knight. Now, Barry Knight, former England player, he owned a an indoor cricket centre in a Sydney mm. suburb uh, where I played indoor cricket. And uh, I started working there and doing some umpiring and, and earning $30 a night when I started out as a, as a high school student. But uh, I was more focused on playing than umpiring. And I suppose I'd describe myself as an accidental umpire, uh, that when I had a back injury at the age of 20, uh, after reaching a fairly good standard in junior cricket, uh, you know, I, I sort of looked at my options and my fast bowling mate with my club side was, was hell bent on becoming an umpire and he dragged me along to an umpiring course. We both sat the, the four nights, uh, did the exam, 
And uh, unfortunately, my mate, he failed the exam and I managed to pass it. And as a university student at that stage, I thought, well, this might be a good way to earn some extra money. So had it not been for a friend and a colleague, um, a fellow player dragging me along to an umpiring course, you and I would not be having this conversation. And something that was a a hobby to a part-time job, then to a full-time job, it's been a tremendous journey so far. Mm. But uh, I need to say this for the benefit of our viewers. You umpired a total of 74 test matches during your career, officiated in 13 matches as a TV umpire. You also took part in 174 ODI matches and 34 T20Is during your long career. And being a, 30, being a third umpire, you officiated in 46 ODIs and 8 T20Is. But everyone wants to know, why did you leave umpiring <laughs> at your peak at the age of just 41? You were literally at your peak. Well, perhaps, and I think for me that is the right time to go. Um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Finding the Gaps and, and I devoted a chapter about why I actually left um, cricket umpiring at that stage. And the chapter was called Use by Date. And I believe that everybody has a use by date uh, in, in their particular job, in their particular role. And I certainly agree with the Shane Warne philosophy of um, people should ask, why did you go? rather than why don't you go. And um, for me, it was about leaving for two reasons primarily. One was personal. You know, I'd I'd spent uh, 13 years on the road uh, away from my family and friends, and I missed my two boys growing up with so much time away from home. Um, And I wanted to be able to see my daughter uh, grow up. And there were professional reasons that, as you said, there's a lot of matches under my belt there. But uh, I felt that I'd achieved a lot in umpiring, and I found a new passion in coaching and training and education and that new passion was taking over and I didn't want to, you know, keep umpiring for the sake of numbers and, and for, you know, trying to pass records or do things like that. Uh, it's tremendously interesting and um, and pleasing to see Arlene Da, who started uh, with the ICC back in 2003 when I did, still mm-hmm. officiating. Um, and that's a great credit to his, um, you know, longevity and, um, yeah, so look, everyone's got to use by date. And for me, I've moved on to bigger and better things and I've done things that I would never dreamt of doing while I was umpiring. Uh, consecutively from 2004 to 2008, mm. you were named ICC Umpire of the Year and generally considered as the best umpire in the world during his time. But you were known for your accuracy, Simon. Uh, and this is what made you a household name also. We want to know from you, sir, you are the best person to answer this question. What are the challenges that umpires face, the pressure, the preparation, and what it takes to be a high-class, high-quality umpire? Yeah, sure. Look, uh, look, thank you for those kind words. I've certainly made plenty of mistakes in my career as well, and I've been incredibly lucky to grow up in the New South Wales environment and have such great mentors and and fellow officials and, and people that I've stood with and and certainly they passed on their experience and wisdom to me. And I think that's probably the first piece of advice that I give to, to people is to, is to use the collective intelligence of your colleagues and peers and to really listen carefully to what they've got to say. Um, we don't have time to make all the mistakes ourselves so, so we can learn from the mistakes of other people. So I took great pride, I think, in trying to do the apprenticeship and not move too quickly through the system. Um, you know, umpiring is all about mistakes. Umpiring is a team sport, um, and and getting up there accepting those individual awards has been rather awkward and somewhat embarrassing at times mm-hmm. because it's about team success, and that's part of the messaging that I, I work with people today, that you need to compete against yourself, but you also need to be successful as a team. And the mm-hmm. umpiring team, to be unnoticed, and we are we should not be the centre of attention, So for me, it's about working towards that team success. But coping with pressure is about making sure that you just keep it simple, that you really remain connected with the moment, that you trust all of your preparation and hard work, and that you try not to second guess and you follow your gut. Um, A lot of us build up, like even in your job, you build up experience and knowledge, and you've got to learn to trust your, your judgment and trust your gut and try not to worry about what other people think too much. Don't mm. put extra pressure on yourself. And I think those mm. qualities are really simple, but they're so important that sometimes uh, cricket's a game that we make 
more difficult than it actually is. We over-complicate the simple game. Hmm. Same goes with the players also. Just make it simple like MS Dhoni says. Uh, but is it uh, difficult to deal with uh, excessive appealing also? Uh, uh, maybe from a bowler, sometimes uh, the captains. Well, it can be. Difficult to handle? Uh, you want to share well, your experience? Well, it experiences? can be. It can be. My philosophy on appealing was I didn't worry too much about uh, an appeal as long as the players uh, respected my decision and, and they just got on with the game. Hmm. Um you know, I think when players work out that you're uncertain, that you're not confident, mm. or that you can buckle under pressure, mm. then I, I think you're likely to see more appealing mm. uh, happen at your end because they're going to try to get a decision to go in their favour. But mm. for me, if you remain firm, calm, considered, confident, consistent, and you give it the way that you see it, you're more likely going to get uh, appealing that is reasonable but that doesn't stop, you know, a lot of people from trying to get things to go their way. And let's face it, sport's about finding that edge and about exploiting every loophole to get things to go your way. So you're going to expect that to a certain extent, but you should never let it affect you. Mm, that's right. So, Simon, you were one of the officials involved in the terrorist attack on the Sri Lankan team bus in 2009 mm. at Lahore. Uh, you were part of a four-match official contingent. I'm, I'm sorry I'm raising this point, but again, mm. uh, you have mentioned this in your book also. Uh, mm. You want to share your experience? Uh, must still be giving you goosebumps. Oh, look, it does. Uh, look, t even today, uh, loud noises, um, mm. lots of commotion, fireworks mm. uh, make mm. me uncomfortable. Um, you know, it was a terrible day for Pakistan, 2009, March the 3rd. A uh, terrible day for our Sri Lankan uh, team participants, a terrible day for, for cricket and also for our people in our van. Um, again, I've shared the story in my book as chapter number one. It's a yeah. chapter called The Hardest Call I've Had to Make. It was about not an LBW or a, a court behind, but a telephone yeah. call that I made to my wife shortly after the incident. Um, a very emotional time, uh, a very sad time, but mm. one that I wanted to share with readers around uh, what I learnt during that uh, terrible experience. You know, people died in our vehicle. Uh, we lost our driver. Um, uh, our son Raza, our fourth umpire, was shot twice in the ch in the chest. Uh, and, um, you know, there were some events on that day that made me realise about what life was all about and about um, how we're all different and how we all see things from a different perspective. And that doesn't make us right or wrong. It just makes us different. Um, and I also wanted to, I suppose, get people to think about uh, umpires are people too. And it's really important that uh, sometimes we, um, we uh, it's just a game of cricket, yeah. you know, and um, I, I think we, we can take that game of cricket to a, a level where it's no longer a game. And I really mm -hmm. wanted to just really get people to think about, well, there are three teams that play the game of cricket. Um, you know, umpires were forgotten on that day uh, for lots of different reasons. Uh, we didn't have our own um, resources to um, to protect us or to look after us or even to come and save us. And I really wanted to get the message across that it's really important that we treat people um, as important and mm. that we're all the same. And it's not about who's an umpire and who's a player, mm. but that we're, we are people too. And uh, I really wanted to share a lot of those learnings and thoughts and, and human stories and attributes with the reader. Mm. Right, and I want to share this with our viewers that uh, Mr. Simon Toffel has shared this. He has elaborated this in the first chapter of Finding the Gaps, uh, the book that he has written. Uh, if you talk about your book, sir, uh, Finding the Gaps, Transferable Skills to be the Best You Can Be. Very, very uh, deep topic. You want to share the highlights of the book? Oh, look, quite simply, it's about uh, you know taking what I've learned, uh, getting to the top in the game of cricket umpiring and how to stay there, um, mm. and about how we've made plenty of mistakes and how we learn through uh, the right attitude and, and good self-discipline and being able to cope with um, uh, setbacks and handle pressure and all those sorts of things that sort of help us be the best that we can be. But, uh, look, just super proud to be able to call on a gentleman by the name of Sachin Tendulkar, someone who mm -hmm. we have a very respectful relationship and friendship with. And okay. uh, to be able to have him write the foreword was, was a, a wonderful um, element to, to the book. 
but I really wanted to, I suppose, uh, help the next generation of, of professionals. And it's not just about cricket, it's about whatever we do. And yes, it is a bit of a deep topic, but I really wanted to share what worked, what didn't work. Um, uh, as I said, how we got to the top and stay there for a while and really just try to make sure that people could relate to the life skills. Because um, mm -hmm. university schools are great on teaching the technical skills, mm -hmm. but I've learned so much more about myself and about what it takes to handle myself uh, on tour and, and recover from the really deep lows of my worst game uh, in England, uh, or my worst test match, and how I've dealt with the pressures of a World Cup final that we talked about earlier on, and, and share some of those uh, tips and tools with the readers. Hmm. A key aspect, uh, Simon, you discuss in the uh, book is the leadership, which is considered hmm. supreme, uh, especially in cricket or in yeah. whatever sport. What is the definition of a good leader or a leader according to you? Well, for me, leadership's all about, you know, can you inspire people to follow you? So hmm. in a lot of ways, leadership is about the followers. It's okay. not necessarily about yourself. And mm -hmm. I think what's really important in, in the book, I talk about you know, three or four captains who have different leadership styles. And it's about adapting your leadership style to the situation that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no one size fits all. And in the book, I talk about Virat Kohli, uh, Mark Taylor, Mahela mm -hmm. Jay Wardner. And it's, it's about inspiring your followers, followers to yeah, to, to to do just that, to follow you and to go places where they've never been before and to trust you yeah. um, and deliver their best and to bring out their best. And the best leaders bring out the best in their followers. There's no oh, question right. about that. And I've seen mm. some great leaders on the cricket field and also off the cricket field. Um, and George Bailey, for one, has got a very interesting take on, on leadership in this space where he talks about you know leadership being a good captain between the hours of 6 p.m. and 11 a.m not between mm. 11 and a.m. and 6 p.m., but it's off the field. And if you think about that as in the workplace, it's about mm. caring for our staff, it's about caring for our people and making sure that they're okay and, and getting their trust and support uh, to go the extra mile for you. Um, so, yeah, look, just sort of tremendous leadership anecdotes, stories and, and lessons to be learned. Hmm. But how will you rate MS Dhoni as a leader or maybe Saurav Ganguly, uh, Steve Waugh, Mark Taylor, you mentioned Imran Khan, yeah. Maila Jayavardhana, Ricky Ponting, list is endless. They all were contrasting personalities They yeah. uh, and all had different styles of leading their teams and all, yep. of, the, all of them are considered biggest captains for their respective teams. For their respective sure, and that doesn't make them right or wrong, you're absolutely yeah. correct, because um, they're all different people. And I think one of the things that we want to see in our leaders is authenticity. We want to see leaders who are themselves yeah. and all themselves, you know, all the time and that they're not just pretending to be something that they're not. Um, so I think it's really important that you be the person that you are. Uh, and I saw that in another leader in Graham Smith as well. Um, but if you look at MS Dhoni, look, he has a great cricket brain. He has an ability to be in front of the game and to also understand... Um, what the opposition doesn't want you to do, and he tends mm -hmm. to do the opposite. But he also has tremendous faith in his players and himself. You know, he's been known as a great finisher uh, with the bat chasing runs for a long, long time. But he's also got an astute cricket brain where he can tactically think about where the game is going and try to yeah. get in front of the game in that way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think those are the sorts of qualities that MS uh, is providing. And you never really see MS front and centre promoting himself or promoting um, him trying to be the centre of attention. Mm -hmm. It's about his team, his results as a team and his players who, you know, I suppose capture most of the spotlight. So he's mm -hmm. a quiet achiever in that way. And we would call that probably level five leadership in the corporate world. But mm -hmm. he's also a very quiet, um, quiet quietly spoken gentleman um, but when he wants to get a point across he can also um, you know be quite loud when he needs to be um, but he's a challenge and I really respect the way that he's captained um, and he goes about his business without too much fuss. Who according to you has been the greatest captain? Oh, for me um, Mark Taylor uh, okay. I think is probably one of the best captains that I've had the pleasure to officiate. Uh, Mark was he had the ability to put the team first uh, you might remember he declared at 3.34 the same score as Bradman uh, against, against Pakistan. 
uh, to give himself and his team enough time to bowl the opposition out. He could have broken Bradman's record, uh, but he put the game and the victory first, which is a great quality. He's also a great thinker. Again, also one that's in front of the game. But he's also prepared to lose the game to win it. And I think tactically that's a very great positive way to play cricket. And the other thing that stuck out for me, Abhishek, was he was very constructive in his captain's reports on umpire's performances. You know, he didn't just say, oh, the umpire missed two court behinds and three LBWs. He talked about concentration, focus, the ability to communicate effectively with the players Mm. and gave different insights and feedback that actually allowed us to feed forward and improve what we were doing. And and I think that showed us that he was um, a real student of the game and cared about what he he wrote. Um, So those attributes were, were standouts in my view. Okay. And also, Simon, uh, you mentioned this in your book also. We want to know uh, from you about sports psychology also. How sports should be played to earn the new Maruno status? Look, I think sports a wonderful teacher. And uh, in the terms of, of psychology, look, not only do you to have to play a test match or to play a lot of sport, mm. you have to be fit mentally, but you also have to be fit physically. Um, but sport teaches us how to deal with setbacks. It also teaches us how to deal with success. Um, and success is never achieved in sport on your own. Uh, there are either people who are coaching you, training you, providing you feedback, or assisting you. Um, so sport's a wonderful teacher in that respect. It also builds character uh, and also develops and shows character. And what's really important in today's world is that we actually become people of good character. Um, mm. You know, we, we spend a lot of time on social media or working through mediums like this, but it's really important that we're able to build relationships, yeah. to add value to a team. And for me, it's about character and chemistry you know, mm. developing and building character, but also chemistry about succeeding in a team environment and bringing skills and giving back to the team. Um, and sport does that very well. Sport also teaches you about being honest and fair income with yourself and also having lots of integrity around the way that you play, not just following the rules, but following the spirit. And that's yeah. about integrity. Mm. Right, very nicely put forward by you. But what do you want to tell uh, to a 10-year-old if he's watching you? Why sports, why playing sports, why outdoor activities are important? What do you want to tell him? His, his, uh, well, because for example, I, if, he's, if he's a yeah. couch potato. Yeah, look, I, I think it's, it's important to get off that couch for a start and get active because um, sports, about it's, it teaches you great life lessons. Um, not only does it look after your health and does it build uh, uh, all sorts of hard skills and being able to run and to catch and to bowl mm. and to bat, but it builds such tremendous soft skills about how to cope in a team environment, how yeah. to yeah. How, how to lead, um, how to think strategically, um, how to learn and develop a skill, yeah. um, how to operate and exist within a team environment and to build some friendships and mates. Mm. And for me, you know, cricket's about mateship too. It's about building friends throughout your career that are lifelong friends and relationships that will stand the, t- the test of time. And, you know, in my journey, I've, I've, I've made so many friends from all different corners of the world, young, old, black, white, um, different religions, different countries. And um, to be able to build the relationships, and I learned off a great guy by the name of David Shepard, you know, what it was like to try and build some of those relationships across all those different barriers. So as a 10-year-old, um, you know, I, I think back to the kids that I, st- I started playing Playing cricket with and I keep in touch with them today. Um, I think back to my first cricket coach who was just a great man and taught me some really good lessons about how to carry myself and what to do, what not to do, how to speak, um, how to use my manners um, and, and look after myself and, and all those skills uh, sport and cricket offers. Hmm. Who are your best friends in uh, cricket fraternity? Uh, do you still you, do you still uh, speak to them? Well, it was only last week that I, I reached out to Harbhajan Singh, Verinder Sawag, who had birthdays. Wow. Um, so it was good to reconnect with them and to drop them a note and to uh, say hello. Um, but look, through, you know, through Twitter, I, through social media, or uh, through uh, no, through um, you know through WhatsApp. So I'm, wow. I'm very lucky to have their, their phone numbers and we we, we connect uh, whenever we can. 
Hmm. Last two questions, uh, Simon, before we wind it up. What are your off-field interests? Uh, you spend a lot of time with your family? I try to. Um, I love watching uh, a bit of comedy. Um, okay. So I like uh, sort of relaxing that way with um, the family. But I also enjoy fishing. I went fishing the other day um, out on my boat, um, which I'm very lucky to be able to do in Australia. I uh, love playing golf. Uh, I love my cars. Uh, so I recently wow. bought a new car and I've been able to, to enjoy driving that. So I enjoy motorsport um, and also driving reasonably fast cars, <laughs> funny enough. But yeah, th those things are great. But more importantly, to be able to do them with my kids or with some people and family that are around us. And that's been probably one of the hardest things with the COVID lockdowns mm. and, and the pandemic is yeah. the restriction on being able to, you know, communicate and network with people that you, you really mm. like and love. Mm. And thank God, and uh, cases are going down now. And uh, yeah. uh, but seriously, uh, uh, Simon, multi-talented you are. You have uh, so many interests, and you do so many things. Uh, last question: uh, When did you learn to speak Hindi? Uh, and you also want to say a few words? Uh, gee, gee. Um, I probably started learning Hindi when I first went to India in the early 2000s, and uh, my first trip to India started off quite poorly actually because i arrived at the airport but there was no one there to pick me up hmm. um so preparing the way that i would normally prepare and and, and the tip that uh, probably daryl harper uh, taught hmm. me early on in my career was to learn some of the local language so learning how to count to six egg dot tin char punch day right through to ten um but but counting to six in the local language is really important learning how to say yes and no uh, please and thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, can, you to... entire, can you speak the entire sentence also in Hindi? Oh, the bottom of Puchna. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think what's really important is that you're able to say bus bus enough or cello, let's go. Um, uh, and, and also the swear words. It's really important to understand the swear words and know what the players are saying about you. I find really helpful. You can't, you can't say that here. <laughs> nee, 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 nee. <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you, Simon, so much. Half, entire half an hour uh, talking to you has been like a learning session for me. Uh, such a great inspiration, such a great personality you are, Simon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving us your precious time to DD India. Thank you. Thank you.